Good afternoon and welcome to the first Origins Institute talk for the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is John Stone, or Doc Rock as my students like to call me, and I'm privileged to be the director for the Origins Institute and your host for today. This is our first online talk. We're recording the proceedings and we'll make the video available so you can share it with your friends and colleagues. After the talk, we'll hold a brief question and answer period. Please send your questions in the Q&A chat we will address as many questions as we can. Our guests traditionally meet with our graduate students after the colloquium talks in a seminar style format, and we'll use some of the time from that as a buffer to end the question and answer period. Before formally introducing our guests, I'd like to relay some information about the Origins Institute. Origins Institute members collectively constitute one among five research intensive centers and institutes in the Faculty of Science and 70 in total at McMaster University. These centers and institutes discover solutions to complicated, multi-dimensional challenges by bringing together interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and in our case, transdisciplinary teams, faculty, education and research staff, postdoctoral researchers, and graduate students and undergraduate students. These teams collaborate with academic, government, and industry partners, and you. Community outreach and engagement is a priority for all centers and institutes at McMaster University. This indeed is the reason why we host talks in collaboration with McMaster Alumni Association. We're showcasing our mandate for the Origins Institute with our colloquia this year, combining our prime research directive, astrobiology, with our original institute themes, this week the origin of space-time. Please note the colloquia are slightly more specialized than our public lectures. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the year, who can actually combine these two topics, Kailash Sahu. Dr. Sahu earned a PhD at the Physical Research Laboratory in India, then gained experience at a variety of institutes, laboratories, and observatories in France, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, before landing as an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where Kailash is an instrument scientist for the Wide Field Camera 3 aboard the Hubble Space Telescope. Kailash focuses research on applying transit, relativistic detection, and microlensing techniques to detect and study exoplanets, stars, black holes, and has published more than 300 papers in a stellar career, and even managed to test an idea first proposed by Einstein. But among the most impressive accomplishments, in my opinion, Kailash has transformed a personal passion following the stars as a child into a professional passion, which we'll witness today. Kailash, as Kailash tells us about a census, a non-political census, of exoplanets in the Milky Way through gravitational microlensing. Welcome, Clash. Thank you, Doc Rock. So uh, I will now share the screen. Is um, I share? Uh, is it possible to see some people as well? Is that uh, I see there are eighty-seven people in there. No, I can't see can't see anybody. Unfortunately, just uh, okay, yeah. you so can go in. Yeah, but we got a okay, uh, yeah, eighty-seven people. So, can people now see my screen? Looking good. Oh, sorry, I have I have in the middle of this. I have a. Uh, Okay, good, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, so I will talk today about uh, this, the exoplanets in the Milky Way, a complete census. We will, at the end, we should have a complete census of the exoplanets in the Milky Way. Uh, so let me, um, since I do not have too much time, let me uh, start right away uh, with an introduction. Mm, okay. Sorry, a little bit of technical trouble I have here. Um, Okay, uh, so let me start. So by the way, I will give a more of an introduction. Um, I have done a lot of work on this, but I, so for when my, my work itself, I will try to go fast because I want to give you a much broader uh, sense of the field. So let's start from home. Let's say, uh, so this is a picture of the earth and the pale blue dot. So this is a picture of the Earth taken from Voyager as it was going at the very last stage. It took a picture um, of the Earth 
And here you see, uh, I suppose you can see the pointer here. Yep, yep, we can see it. Okay, good. So um, I tried to make the pointer a little big so that people can see. So this is the um, earth in the zodiacal belt, you can see that. So this is, um, this occupies just one pixel. So Carl Sagan in his book, Pale Blue Dart, a copy of which I have right here, uh, it says, look at that dart, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Of course, he keeps going, he has written a whole book, but the idea is, so this is all we have. This is our, our, the pale blue dot. Now, when you look at the sky, you know, this is a picture which I took when I went to Cerro Tololo in Chile. As you look up the sky, you see lots of stars. Now, Dave, can we have the first poll question now? So, uh, uh, yes, sure. So I'll go ahead and launch see. it. How, as you look up to the sky, uh, how many stars can you generally see through just naked eye? Is it 500, 5,000, 50,000, 1 million? How many stars do you think you see when you look up in the sky? So does it take long to get the answer? Or I don't know how it works. Yeah, you should be seeing some, uh, did you get a pop-up? Yes, I did. So we can see actually we have we have the two questions here. So we have the first one about how many uh, yeah, we can yeah. see in the so, sky. And then 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 the next question is how many stars are there in the galaxy? Is this ten million, one billion, ten billion? How many? Or hundred billion? Or a trillion? And we have about 57, 60% of people have voted. Oh, there we go. We're up to about 70 people voting there. So I think I'll, I'll cut off the poll in about five seconds here. So any last there we go. Thank you, everybody. And I'll end the poll and everybody should see uh, the results here. Do I see the poll results? So we have uh, for the first question, uh, how many stars can you generally uh, see with your naked eye in the sky? We had the top result being 1 million with 34% of the vote and the second spot 5,000. Um, and then trailing slightly behind that, we had 50,000 and the lowest uh, with 16% of the votes going to 500. As for the second question, how many stars are there in the galaxy? The top answer was 10 million with 43% of the votes, very close to the uh, second most uh, selected answer. One trillion got 40%. Uh, and then right behind that, 1 billion, 12% and 10 million with 4%. Okay, so, so um, yeah, so you, you know, I see, yeah, so I see that here now. Uh, so, you know, as you look up, yeah, pretty good. So um, as you look up in the sky, here there is a picture. You see this is full of stars, but that actually is not too much. Actually, you see only about, so let me see. Uh, now I have, so there are totally, there are about 100 billion stars in the galaxy, okay? So you guys were not too off. But when you uh, look up into the sky, naked eye, you can only see up to about 6, 6.5 magnitude stars. And there are approximately between 5,000 to 10,000 stars. So all that you see is only about 5,000 to 10,000 stars on a clear night sky. Of course, it depends on which part of the sky. If you look at the southern hemisphere, it's slightly longer, more. Um, but that's only a very small part of the uh, actual number. There are 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and you see generally 5,000 stars. In, so how common, as you look, the main question that we want to answer is, how common are the planets? You know, in, and how common particularly is pale blue dot? How common is Earth-like planets um, in the galaxy? That's the question that we will try to explore in this entire talk. Uh, that's the main theme, okay? Now, so the, the, let me now go through a little bit of um, history, so how the extrasolar planet discoveries. Of course, when I was young, we never, we knew, we knew nothing about exoplanets, nothing new. So 
and the very first extrasolar planet was discovered around a rapidly spinning neutron star of all places. It's called 1257 plus 12. It was through a, a, a involved technique called pulsar timing. The next big discovery was through radial velocity. The very first extrasolar planet around a normal star, 51 peg, was discovered through a radial velocity technique. And this was actually a Jupiter-like planet with a period of only about 4.2 days. So here you see in the animation, so this is if there is a star going around this, this plus sign here is the center of gravity, center of mass of these two. As the planet, as the planet comes this way, the star has to move that side so that the center of mass remains constant. So as the planet moves like this, the star also slightly wobbles, as you see. And as the star, star wobbles, you the radial velocity as the red as the star is moving away from you, then the wavelength shifts to the right as it comes close to you, it moves to the to the blue. So if by looking at the star, how it moves away or towards you, you can infer whether there is a planet. And how, by how fast it's moving, you can tell the mass of the accompanying planet. Um, I hope that's clear. So th this was the very first technique, um, very first planet around a normal star through this technique it was discovered. Then the, after that, there have been, you know, this, the, uh, the extrasolar planets, there are a lot of planets have been discovered through transits. Um, I will, let me go, um, skip this one. I'm having trouble. Okay. So after that, you know, the most, the, right now we have lots of planets uh, discovered through a technique called transits. The Kepler telescope, for example, this was um, this is a montage of several uh, planets around different stars. This is a Kepler telescope. The Kepler telescope, what it did was it monitored continuously this particular patch of the sky continuously for several years. And if a planet comes in front of another star, then it will slightly dim the star and reveal the presence of the planet. So this way it uh, we discovered many planets and right now, till now, there are, this is a, um, till 22nd October 2020, they, uh, this is one week old, results all the planets that have been discovered so far. So these are the radial velocity planets, these are the transit planets, there are some planets which are which have been detected through microlensing which I will next I will talk about and uh, through um, direct imaging also right now as you see there have been approximately more than 4000 planets have been detected and these planets include planets in the habitable zone planets earth sized planets multiple planet systems all kinds of planets have been discovered so the very first planet was discovered around a normal star was discovered only in 95 and within the last 25 years we have discovered more than 4000 planets So the, uh, here is one, so there are a few which stand out. One here, for example, the, the Spitzer telescope not only detected the planet, but it also detected the planet's light itself in the sense if the planet comes in front of the star, the star lights get blocked. So you can see this. But as the star comes in front, now the planet's light is blocked. So the planet itself contributes this light. So the planet, as it is blocked, you can see the, the, the planet's light being blocked in this, at this location here. And this is blown up here, you can see. So this was a direct detection of the planet's light being blocked. Um, now there is uh, most recently there is this TESS telescope which was a specially um, um, designed exoplanet uh, survey satellite, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, that's TESS, uh, which is continuously monitoring uh, lots of stars, about 85% of the sky it continuously monitors 
well, in in uh, uh, in several chunks. It, at, at any given time, it uh, about one third of the sky or one sixth of the sky it covers, and then within three years it covers the entire um, entire sky. So it has discovered the main idea of this uh, test is to detect Earth-like planet around a um, you know close by stars. So it has now uh, several planets it has been discovered. I don't want to go through all these details now, but there are um, right now, for example, about more than 100 planets have been detected. Um, and 29 of them have been confirmed, and four of them have um, less than four Earth radii. So let me summarize so far. So I, very quickly, I went through these various programs. So the planets, all the planets, but the, you know, so far through all these techniques, transits, uh, the radial velocity and tests, all the planets that have been discovered so far have been around stars within about 300 parsecs. That means within about 1000 light years from us. But the galaxy is huge. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years. Is it, we don't know what happens as you go beyond this little bubble of uh, 1000 parsecs. We know also that the planets are pretty abundant. We have discovered so far 4,000 planets. And if you take the statistics, it turns out that planet, planets are pretty abundant. And then these hot Jupiters, the Jupiter-like planets, which are orbiting very close to the star, like the one very first one det detected around 51 Pegasus, which had an orbital period of only 4.2 days. That means it is very close to the star. That kind of planets are pretty common. And uh, also we have found from the um, Kepler data that the small planets are actually much more common than the large planets. And from the radial velocity technique, we have also seen that the planet formation, you know, this is a bit esoteric, but the metallicity of the, of the star that favors the planet formation. Now, looking at this, what are the main questions that we want to ask? So here is a picture of our galaxy. Well, it's not a picture of our galaxy because we can't see a, take a picture of our galaxy itself because we are inside it. But this is a picture of a similar a galaxy which is very similar to our galaxy M51. And if this was our galaxy, our sun is at this far. So if this is the center of the, the, of the galaxy, we are so far. Now, all the planets, this, this little circle that you see is not the sun, but this circle corresponds to about 300 parsecs, okay? So that means all the planets, 4,000 planets that we have, been we have discovered so far are confined to this little circle in this entire galaxy. So if then we want to ask how common are the planets at um, at other places in the, in the galaxy. So are they equally common in other parts of the galaxy? How common are Earth-like planets at, at different distances from the sun? Uh, then the other metallicity I told you, does it same thing, similar the planet properties that we found in, within our 3,000 3, um, light years, uh, 300, uh, 1000 light years, is it the, are the properties similar if we go to outer parts of the galaxy? These are the questions that we will actually ask in this talk, okay? So if we want to ask the question of what happens as we go outside the galaxy, out in the outer parts of the galaxy, then micro lensing is one that can give the most correct answer because microlensing is a technique which actually avoids the, um, the problem of how far the star is. Because you know, for looking for radial velocity transits, you, the star itself has to be bright. Whereas for microlensing, the star has to be ju just, the lens has to be just massive enough. You don't have to see, it just its gravitational effect is what you see. Okay, so let's, um, let me give a little more um, introduction to microlensing itself. 
So as I said, microlensing is currently the only technique which is capable of detecting Earth-like planets at, several, at distances of several astronomical units and at large distance from the sun. Uh, so if you have a, this, if we are the observer here, O, and if this is a, there is a source, there is a star here, and if there is a lens in the middle, the, then the star will get deflected. Let me go explain a little more in detail in the next slide here. So, well, so li again, a little bit of introduction. So, th by the way, so I worked a lot on this microlensing, um, as I will show you now. But this microlensing is not a new idea. It's, you know, since 1800, uh, let me see. So 1800, um, the Soldner, he proposed that there would be, if a foreground star uh, comes in front of the background star, the starlight should be deflected. Uh, but the correct picture, the, um, the, uh, the full correct theory was given by Einstein in a very small paper. He wrote a paper uh, in science in 1936. It is, this is what happens to be one of the, my most favorite papers. Uh, this is just a one page paper where it starts saying that some time ago, Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I had made at his request. This note complies with his wish. Well, we don't write papers like this anymore, but this is, so he wrote about the whole microlensing in this little paper. Um, okay, this is, a, this is a story of how it happened. I will not, I don't have much time to go into this. Um, but um, I want to give you a little introduction on microlensing. It's a little tutorial, um, just a two minute tutorial. I, after this, we sh you should be an expert on microlensing. So let's see here. Uh, look at the, uh, so here uh, is a lens. So a lens is the, there's a lens star which is closer to us. And here the green point is, this, is the source. Uh, this is a distant star and this is a, the center, the, the red dot is a lens. Now this circle is so-called Einstein circle, the Einstein ring. Imagine if you look at the sky, the sky, the stars look fixed. But if you have a very powerful telescope and monitored for a large number of many years, you would see that the stars actually move. So this is a large blow up. So in the sense, this entire picture is just one milliard second. So if in this Einstein ring, suppose a distant star passes within this Einstein ring. Then as it passes through the Einstein ring at any given point, at this point, for example, you would have, there are two images. So one, is a, the, as I showed you in the previous slide, the, the, this splits into two images. One image is formed outside the Einstein ring and one image is formed inside the Einstein ring. And so there are three properties that you need to know. One is that all these, the, um, the, the lens, the source, and these three, two images, they'll always lie in a straight line. Then the one outside is slightly brighter. The image outside is brighter than the inner side. And you don't see the, the you know, you don't have to see the lens itself. So all you see is actually this, uh, uh, this configuration, but you don't see these two images and the lens. All you see is this extra brightening because as it passes by, then the, the, when it splits into two images, the, it is also amplified. The, the image has magnified in size. So you see the star brightening. So if you monitor at this image, suddenly you will see that the one of the stars has brightened in this particular fashion. Okay. So this is the uh, microlensing. If one star passes within the Einstein ring of another star, which is front, then you will see a brightening of the star in this characteristic fashion. And this now, so, so the, as the, the brightening is now the, given by this area of these two 
divided by the original area and that's what the battery number. Now, the same one, let, let us put it in one single picture here. So you see the same, the, uh, the whole configuration. Suppose, so this is the lens and this is the Einstein ring. As the source passes, there are these images. So at any given time, for example, at this point, you have these two images and this was the source and this has brightened up to this here. Now imagine this, this lens has a planet at this location. Then what, what will happen is as the star passes through this Einstein ring, then at this point, for example, that one of the images has come very close to the planet itself. So that means now the planet will cause an extra brightening of this image. So this would be an extra brightening caused by the planet. So if this lens has a planet, then it's possible that during the microlensing, the image will come close to it so that there will, there will be an extra brightening as shown in this bottom panel here, and that would be a characteristic signature of the planet. So that's how we try to detect a planet through microlensing, okay? So this was actually a long time ago in 1995 when I was a postdoc, I started this um, planet collaboration. At that time, the few microlensing events had been detected and um, we thought, okay, so at, at that time, even the very first microlensing planet, no planet had ever been discovered. Um, so, the, so we thought, okay, this is a, very cool technique we can use to detect planets. So we started a collaboration called PLANET, which stands for Probing Lensing Anomalies Network. Uh, so we we wanted to look for this extra little signal. So this is, you know, Penny Sackett and myself, we started, both of us were postdocs at, at Nether, in Netherlands in Groningen. Uh, so if uh, this happens, then the uh, so what we need to do is monitor this microlensing event continuously so that this extra blip caused by this planet we can detect. So we formed a collaboration so that we can monitor the microlensing events through four different telescopes appropriately situated in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, one in the uh, South Africa, two in Australia, and one in Chile, so that we can continuously monitor. So the aim was, you know, to detect the first planet ever. So the, the, at that time, we were naive. Uh, there was no planet had been discovered yet. So if every star has a Jupiter, then one seventh of, we'd calculated that one in seven stars should show a planetary signal. So we decided that we will monitor at least seven events that year and we will detect our first planet. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. But so, but so far we have monitored 200 events, okay? Including lots of binaries and all that. So the question now, the next quote, the question. We have monitored, it's a tricky question. It's a, it's a trick question. So, you know, uh, it, actually the, what is written here is may not be enough to just to give you a hint. It may not be enough to actually answer the question, but, but it's an interesting question. So we have monitored because I went through this every day. We kept on monitoring, kept on monitoring. We said how many planets we should detect by now. So we monitored 200 events. How many planets? So Dave, the next poll would be how many planets we should have discovered by now if we monitor 200 events. So if, if every planet has a Jupiter, one seventh of them should pl show a planetary signal and we have monitored 200. How many we should have detected by now in our microlensing program? As I said, this is a trick question. So, so let's see how, what you think uh, because I did you know, the very first year um, we monitored seven. Um, it took us pretty much the entire, I hardly slept, you know, 16 hours a day. We kept working for two months. Um, we monitored seven um, and we 
you know, that, that particular year actually we did not detect any. And then we continued next year. Uh, so maybe next year we'll detect. So, um, yes, the, uh, so you got it right that 30%, 30 should have been. We should detect 30 and that was our, you got right in the sense if one in seven, 200, we should have 30. So, and that was our expectation as well. Uh, and I lived with this for several years thinking that we should have detected by 30 and we did not. And the reason now is this. So here it says that if every star has a Jupiter, it doesn't say Jupiter like, it's if every star really has a Jupiter in the sense, if it, every star has a Jupiter at five astronomical units, then we will detect. Unfortunately, that's not the case. What happens is the Jupiter at, you know, five astronomical unit is a very convenient uh, place where the, just the Einstein ring happens to be. So that is where the density, the microlensing probability becomes maximum. Unfortunately, all the Jupiters actually are not at five U. They are distributed and where the probability goes down. So if you take the entire probability into account, then it turns out that there will be only about 10. And so we detected, so far we have detected 10, um, but I want to go through this. So, the, so since we, the very first one we did not detect, we monitored seven, we didn't detect anything. And in the meantime, that year, the, red, the transit people discovered one planet. That was a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> And we thought, but anyway, so we, we thought we will, um, next we will detect. Um, okay, so we went through this. Um, so then in many years, about 10 years later, we detected our very first planet. This was very uh, interesting. So this is where so we monitored this particular um, event. And as you see, at this point, it there was an extra peak and that extra peak we, we observed in all, all the three telescopes and the different telescopes as it went by with this was Chile and then South Africa, then Australia, then back Chile, South Africa. We monitored this at several telescopes um, and this comes out to be a, the, the mass of this came out to be a five Earth mass planet. Okay. And by that time, 2005, actually, Earth mass five Earth mass planets had not been discovered yet. So this was the very first five Earth mass planet discovered. So now, um, so this is a take, this. Uh, I hope you guys can see this. This is a very cool um, uh, simulation. So this is the lens. Now this the lens. As you see, this Einstein ring. This is the star. One of the images is blown up now, and now the planet is actually going across one of the images and causing this extra beep on the slide curve. Now. <clears throat> So microlensing technique, I want to give you a little bit of analogy. So the microlensing technique is inherently more sensitive to detecting big planets. It's big planet, just, it's just like, you know, you see, um, let's say, I don't know, I'm just making up now. So you, suppose you are going um, somewhere um, in a jungle uh, and there are all kinds of things there. Uh, let's say there are elephants, uh, tigers, squirrels, and all kinds of things. And you see, first things you come across are the squirrels. Uh, that means in the jungle, uh, the, since you see, saw the squirrels first, that means the squirrels must be must must vastly outnumber the elephants because elephant you can see from miles away. Squirrels have to be really close by to be able to see. The fact that you, you saw the squirrel means they must be most abundant. If the if the if the elephants were as abundant as the squirrels, you should have seen from miles away lots of elephants. So it's the same. So if we find an Earth-like planet rather than a Jupiter-like planet, that means which we are not, we are less sensitive to the Earth mass planets. That means the Earth-like planets are much more common than the Jovian planets. I just gave you a little analogy, but, uh, but of course we did the mathematically, it turns out that there have to be at least 10 times more uh, abundant than jo Jovian planets. Okay, I've spent a lot of time on this. Um, 
So the conclusion from this is that the, the uh, sub-Neptune mass planets are more abundant than Jovian mass planets. The, uh, on average, the every star, if you take the statistics, it turns out that every star has, a, has at least one uh, planet. Means on average, every star has one or more planets with mass more than five solar mass, five uh, Earth mass. And since microlensing probes all the way to the entire galaxy, now we can say that the microlensing, uh, the, the, the planets are abundant in all parts of the galaxy. Now, now we want, I want to go to a, uh, another program. So this is what we saw that the, the Earth mass planets are much more common and almost all stars have planets. But there are several other key questions that we asked, which we need to ask, answer. Uh, how the, are planets equally abundant in other parts of galaxy? So microlensing, of course, we, we looked at towards the galaxy and uh, we want to know, are these hot Jupiters, microlensing, we saw only these low mass planets, are these big planets, are they common? Are they as abundant as they are in um, in the local uh, part of our galaxy, are these you know the heavy metal abundance that favors planet formation? Is it the same in other parts of the galaxy? Uh, this is a big program which I worked on for several years. So, but I will go through very quickly since I'm already close to uh, when I should almost end. Um, so we uh, had a program called the SWEEPS, the Sagittarius Window Eclipsing Extrasolar Planet Search. Um, so we monitored, so the program likes this, uh, works like this. So if a planet comes across a, um, the surface of a star, then as it passes in front, it blocks a little light so that we can see the, that the light goes down now and it goes in a periodic way and that gives the uh, radius of the planet. So this is the technique that we used. Uh, the probability is of course very small because uh, it has to come exactly in front of the star. So we need to monitor lots of stars. So the probability is very small because as you can see, for example, here, if the planet goes in front of the star in this way, then it doesn't come in, in front. But if the planet, the inclination is such that it comes right in front, then you will see. So then um, the, also the probability is low because the, if the orbital period is long, then you need to monitor continuously for a very long period. So all this, if you combine, then it turns out that if you monitor for about one week, then one in 10,000 would show such uh, transiting signals. So this is a cool, uh, so, so we need to monitor, if we want to detect planets, uh, so our idea was to go look at a sample of stars, which is as far away as possible. So that means, towards the galactic bulge, but there is, it has to be also uh, a crowded field because we need lots of stars. So we looked at the galactic bulge. Uh, so this is as you, in the southern sky, this would be, as you look up the sky, this is how it looks. This is the galactic center and our sweeps field is here. Uh, so we monitored uh, 180,000 stars within this little field for continuously for, uh, for seven days. Now, let, so let's zoom into this field. So this is the, let's zoom into this night sky now. So as we are zooming on, so now you can see this is the digitized sky survey, digitized sky survey, um, and let's zoom further. And this is now the Hubble Space Telescope image. This is the Hubble Space Telescope image. Now, as we zoom further, well, this is like, now actually it's a simulation. It's not the image anymore. So this is one of the stars as it comes in front, then we would see the, the transit, signal, transit signal. So we monitor, uh, monitor this sweeps field for continuously for seven days. We monitored 180,000 stars. Uh, and uh, uh, when we got the results, um, so this, uh, we, we discovered, as you will tell you, we discovered 16 planets. Uh, we published in Nature. Uh, this is the 
So at that time, the Time magazine picked up our story and they ran the image, this appeared in nature, so they picked up from there and they put, you know, the, every week they have um, a collage of pictures, six pictures, out of which people have to choose which picture they like the most. So that in this particular Time uh, magazine, that issue, they had these six pictures. Um, and I particularly like this because one of them, our, our competitors was Barack Obama. Um, so this was you know, a long time ago when we have our, a completely different election tomorrow. Um, in fact, even Canada, I think that people are very interested in the US, more interested in the US election maybe than uh, the Canadian election, which I heard. But anyway, so the, the Barack Obama uh, at that time was coming up and we beat Barack Obama. We, our picture was the um, people's choice, the picture of the week. So this is, um, so the, I was very pleased that the American um, people were, you know, the audience, they like, they are very interested in science in general and they picked the science picture uh, compared to the, the political ones. Right, so, um, so in one, we, but this is a complicated technique, oh, sorry, this is what, what I, I generally give this analog. So this is a very um, difficult experiment in the sense, so one in 10,000 stars actually shows the, um, uh, the signal. So here is, uh, this is in a Baltimore local, uh, it's not far from where I live, uh, there's a little street where uh, in every Christmas time, they, every approximately 15 houses, every house they light their their houses they all participate in this uh, uh, in this festivity so they uh, in this particular street so here uh, from say Feb december 25th christmas to near uh, the seven days window in this particular picture there are say, approximately 10000 light bulbs okay now, out of these 10,000 light bulbs, one light bulb will dim by, a, by about two hours per night. One of them will dim, slightly dim, not, not completely go away, slightly dim for approximately two hours every night uh, on the seven days. And our project was to detect that particular light bulb and how much it went by. So this was a very difficult project. It, it took me completely my time for two years, but anyway. So the, I want to just give you a, a, a snapshot of what we do to get to actually detect these, um, these light signals, so very quickly. So here is an animation. So this is a, a small part of our sweeps image as taken through, telescope, through the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is a small part, which is repeated five times, okay? So this means, so this is the, uh, as it comes, so this actually, the picture changes every half a second. So we, we get one image every 10 minutes, but this is now fast every five, uh, every half a second it changes. So this is the image that we get. And uh, then after we, re we remove the cosmic rays, this is what you see the second panel. This third panel shows the actual ones that we actually, uh, uh, sorry. Third panel shows the ones that we actually, um, the cosmic rays that were detected. And this is um, a, a representation of the convolution kernel that we use to correct for that. And then finally, the difference image is this. So you see, if the stars are constant, this should be nothing. There should be nothing here. But you can see that the difference image, there are a couple of stars. I particularly chose a couple of stars which are actually changing. So looking at this, you can see that the see these stars are actually varying in brightness. So then of course we go through this. So uh, anyway, I don't have time to go through this, but so if this is the time um, series, the, uh, the signal, then we get it uh, here, we get a Fourier signal and then we take that period and then we fold that, then you see the signal much more clear. As you expand, you see the transit signal much more clear. So this is the one where we actually detected 16 planets. This is all the planetary signals that we found, five of them, um, and out of the 16. Um, so this was actually a um, 
it like this this was it also this happens to be in some of the uh, uh, the museums this is with us this is the water art museum in baltimore they have put, put this picture uh, as a window to the universe and um, so this is a famous picture by now uh, anyway so um, i don't have time to go into this um, so the properties of these planets um, the range uh, the planets range orbital ra period ranges from 0.4 to 4 days uh, the planets are jovian planets um, uh, so we of course did uh, some of them we confirmed through radial velocity technique uh, because the uh, uh, some of the to make sure that we are not affected by false positives we, we looked at radial velocities which confirmed these um, after which it was time to celebrate. Um, so this is an artist's impression of one of the planets, closing planets. Um, so <clears throat> what does it mean? So that it means, as I told you, so if, the, if every star, if the stars have the same properties as the local neighborhood, we should have, we should detect one in 10,000. We monitored about 180,000 and we found 16. So it's exactly about the same. So the so, uh, the planet frequency in the bulk sample is similar to the solar to the solar neighborhood. So the key questions: How common are, uh, are Earth-like planets at large orbital separations? Well, we asked you know, to be answered. Yes, they are um, through microlensing. And then, uh, are the planets equally abundant in other parts of the galaxy? We had two different surveys, and the answer is yes. And are hot Jupiters common around a very different population? Because the SWIFTS program actually looked for hot Jupiters. And yes, it was the same. And does the heavy element abundance favor planet formation? Again, the answer is yes. I didn't go into the details. I skipped those slides. But the um, uh, but if you look at this, uh, the, uh, uh, the color magnitude diagram, it shows that the heavy element actually favors planet formation. What about beyond the galaxy? Now, um, I want to end with, uh, with perhaps this the beyond the galaxy. So this is uh, what I talked to you is slightly different from many others which uh, give, you know, all the local planets discovered in the local uh, area. So whereas what we explored here in this, in this talk is how common are the planets, how, what are their properties in the entire galaxy rather than uh, confined to the, uh, to the space close to the sun itself. Now, what happens beyond the galaxy? Can we tell anything beyond the galaxy? Well, we don't have any, um, planets discovered beyond the galaxy yet but let's, let's look so this is a the uh, the i think i'm coming to the end so this is uh, uh, maybe one more slide i have so this is the this is the ultra deep field um, this is the deepest image of the sky so we i was a part of this we uh, monitored one little patch of the sky uh, Hubble looked at this part for 10 days, 10 continuous days. Uh, this was a dark patch of the sky. This is an extremely small area in the sense if you hold, the example with that we give is if you hold a grain of rice at arm's length towards the sky, then the, the area of sky covered by this grain of rice is the same as the area of this field. And that was a completely dark patch of the sky and we found 3,000 galaxies in this. It's, you know, almost all of these are galaxies. So in this little patch of the sky, there are 3,000 galaxies. And each little galaxy is almost as big as our Milky Way, okay? So this is, you know, and this, the same thing actually Hubble, it was repeated in a completely different part of the sky and it's the same, the same again, the other part has again 3000 galaxies. So this is the deepest image of the galaxy, which, which showed that even in this little tiny area of the sky, there are 3000 galaxies. So if you 
if you take the entire sky, there would be about 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion is, you know, if you, 100 billion to give a, a, a sense, if you uh, count the grains of sand in the entire, all the uh, uh, beaches in the entire um, earth, it's still not 100 billion. It's, 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 it's a factor of 10 to the So that many galaxies and then each one of them has about 100, 10 billion uh, stars. So how common are stars? So to answer this question, we of course we don't know, we do not know the answer to this question, we have not detected any, but the, what you saw in the sweeps field, that's the galactic bulge field, okay? And the galactic bulge field is as close it comes to the environment in other galaxies. This is a, uh, out of 3000 galaxies, a large fraction of these galaxies are elliptical galaxies. And these elliptical galaxies, the properties of the elliptical galaxies, which are, these are old galaxies, the mixture of population, the, some are metal rich, some are metal poor, uh, and galactic bulge is exactly the same properties. It's an old population, it has um, metal poor stars, as well as metal rich stars, um, crowding is similar to these, and so um, the star density. And so if you want to take a representation of any galaxy, it is what we saw in that sweeps field. So if the sweeps field is, is any hint, there should be, you know, each of these 100 billion galaxies should have, you know, out of these 10 billion multiplied by 100 billion, there should be trillions of, uh, of planets in this. Now, I want to go to the last um, poll now. We want to see, this is pretty much my end. Um, so, do you think there is life in planets around other stars? So this is the answer that we do not know, okay? So, but I want to get a sense of how many, how, whether you think there would be planets around other stars. So do you think, there is a life in some planet around other stars. I give you a picture of how many planets there should be, planets of all kinds of different properties, um, planets that are multiple, there are um, multiple planets, Earth-like planets, all kinds of planets. Do you think there will be life uh, in other stars as well? So let's see what, what you guys think. I'll give my hint. Wow, <laughs> 97, you know, this is, as you know, this, we do, I cannot say which one is, uh, who is correct, who is not, I do not know, but I can only tell you that I am in that camp of 97%. I hope we will find someday, um, I will give a very brief introduction on what we are going doing next. Okay. So let me, um, Summarize, so within 300 parsecs, the planets are common um, and the hot Jupiters um, are common. The, splan, the small planets are more common. Metallicity uh, favors planet formation. Then um, from uh, microlensing, we found that the sub-Neptune sub planets are more common. Jupiter like, uh, more common than the Jupiter uh, like planets. Uh, beyond 0.5 AU, planets are at least as as frequent as the stars themselves. Then from uh, SWEEPS project, we discovered 16 planets. These were the first exoplanets discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this also was the biggest sample at that time anyway, but, but this is the farthest sample of planets ever discovered. And this shows you know, all these properties were confirmed, the metallicity dependence of planet frequency holds in other parts of this galaxy. And we saw there are indeed billions of planets in the galaxy. And planets may be just as common as the entire universe. And our poll says, yes, there must be life out there as well. Um, so the future missions, well, there is James Webb Space Telescope and the Roman Telescope, maybe, maybe, maybe we might have something in question with that. Okay, I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Kailash. We, we do have a number of questions. Um, and 
I think we can extend the question period a little bit past the half hour. So uh, if anyone has to go, you can always uh, depart on your own. And in a few minutes, um, our technical guru, Dave Dawson, will allow us uh, a way to meet uh, separately. But uh, let's ask a few questions first. Um, so these ones, oh yeah, so. Um, do binary stars hold as many planets as single stars based on studies up to date? Uh, good question. So uh, binary stars, this is, of course, there, it's, it's a little harder, but there have been um, some binary stars um, uh, hosting planets have been discovered both through micro lensing as well as through transits. So some of the, um, uh, yes, there, indeed, the. It, the statistics is not as much because it becomes intrinsically harder to find uh, planets around binary stars. But yes, there, um, that answer is definitely yes. There is, uh, there are stars which are so there are two kinds of uh, planetary systems in binary stars have been found. In um, in some cases, there are planets have been found which orbit around the entire binary planet system. So and in uh, also there have been some planets have been found which is the orbiting around the one of the planets one of the stars and the binary companion is around the uh, it's a binary companion uh, the uh, two binary stars but the planet is only around one star so both kinds of things have been found found yes so um, yeah. okay thank you um another question was um uh, could microlensing be confused by multiple planets in a star planet system? Um, a very good question. Yes, in fact, uh, microlensing, in principle, it can be confused, but um, the, uh, the probability of being confused becomes much less. The probability of being um, confused much less because the probability of microlensing itself is about 10%. Now, if there are two planets, then the probability that the other planet will also have an effect is again 10%. So one in 10 uh, can actually be uh, affected by this extra planet, but it has a signature, means you can actually see the signature of the other planet um, and by proper modeling, uh, you can detect multiple planets in a system. So in a few cases, the multiple planets can be detected in through microlensing techniques. A um, lot of the, there have been a lot of uh, um, binary uh, stars have been detected through microlensing. And one, as I told before, one of them actually has a planet. So not only the binary star, but a planet has been discovered. So in similar, uh, the binary plus a planet is similar to star plus two planets although the probability now of being microlensed by the second planet is smaller. But in principle, yes, you, um, so it gives, um, you know, I wouldn't say get confused, but it gives, it's, it gives an extra, um, makes the light curve more complicated, which can be modeled to, re to deduce uh, the information of the other planet as well. Okay, great. Um there are uh, several more questions. I'll ask two of them, and then we'll break into the seminar session format. And uh, I will try to ask the remaining questions during that time if the opportunity presents itself. So uh, I'll ask the next two questions first. Um, how will the James Webb telescope be used to help study exoplanets, or is the Raman scope better suited for these purposes? Yeah, so actually that's one of the next one I had, which I skipped. So, so this is the right I actually had. So the future James Webb Space Telescope actually will um, uh, will uh, launch next year. Uh, now people are already more, you know, the proposal deadline is the uh, is this this month. So if you're if anybody is thinking of proposing for the James Webb Space Telescope time, this is the time now. The twenty fourth is the deadline. So James Webb Space Telescope will actually be extremely efficient in, um, in, the, in this, the transits. So Hubble Space Telescope has been used to look for uh, the planetary atmospheric signatures. 
So during transit, what happens is as the planet comes in front of the star, then the star, uh, the planet, if planet has an atmosphere, then the planet, it's the, the atmosphere of the planet will cause an extra dip. Suppose this is, a, um, this is an oxygen feature. So this oxygen in the atmosphere will cause this dip. Um, so that kind of feature actually has been detected through Hubble Space Telescope, but, uh, but James Webb Space Telescope would be much more efficient and it can actually detect uh, such signatures from much, you know, al uh, almost Earth-like planets. Um, uh, so hopefully uh, we, the James Webb Space Telescope can detect the oxygen kind of uh, signatures from real Earth-like planets. Uh, that would be a pretty um, amazing discovery. And also James Webb Space Telescope is um, very efficient in detecting directly imaging uh, the close by planets. And then um, how do you determine the composition of an exoplanet when it's hard even to view them clearly due to their stars? So um, this is again the same. So the, the composition of the planet, uh, what we can detect is the composition of the atmosphere of the planet. So the atmosphere of the planet, we can directly see that. So for example, if the atmosphere of the planet has oxygen, say, then you look for, as the planet comes in front of the star, only in those ones when it transits the star, as it comes in front, the atmosphere will block the light in this oxygen band. It will block the light. So this is the oxygen feature. So if you see an extra blocking of light in this particular uh, band where the oxygen is supposed to block uh, the light, this oxygen feature, this will tell you that there is oxygen uh, in the atmosphere. So far as the planetary composition itself is concerned, we don't, we can't detect directly, but people, you know, looking at that, you know, what is the expected temperature, how far it is from the, uh, from that particular star, how much is the mass we can detect through radial velocity, how much is the radius we can measure from the transit, then you, by a model one can see, whether one can deduce whether they are rocky planets or um, solid or, or liquid uh, planets. Uh, so some sense of composition one may be able to model, but that's not a direct uh, determination, but a model dependent. Uh, Composition determination. All right, fantastic. Um, we'll give Kalash a few seconds to catch his breath while um, our technical guru, Dave Dawson, gives us an instruction about the next steps. I have not forgotten about the questions, so I will retain them. And when we go to the uh, seminar session, if the opportunity presents, I certainly will ask those questions.